So, as um, uh, Professor Marcello has already told, this is quite a basic uh, presentation because, you know, Fluomicro, the title of, uh, of this course, and uh, we thought that it was a, a good idea to have a sort of refresh of uh, some concept. And, sorry. And so, first of all, why we would like to go with fluorescence before uh, try to figure out what is fluorescence. Generally, we want to we like to work with fluorescence because this helps us to determine the localization of specific uh, and multiple elements. We can determine the shape of organs, cells, intracellular structures. Uh, we will see also later on, you know, ions. Uh, we have several different types of probes. Moreover, with life, with uh, fluorescent microscopy, you will see you can work also in live samples. So you can also examine the dynamics of the cells, of the protein, of subcellular structure, and so on. Moreover, we can also study interaction and different conformation in, the, in our sample. The main concept of why we want to go to fluorescence is because, uh, first of all, allow us to go with high resolution, but mainly the main point is that we have high contrast and high specificity. Then it's so good that we can also be uh, at least semi-quantitative or quantitative. We can also do lifestyle imaging, but I want really to take you as a, a take a message, the fact that fluorescent microscopy is one of the best to achieve high contrast and high specificity. Why high contrast? High contrast because in fluorescent microscopy, the sample is not uh, interacting with the light, changing the bright field illumination, uh, producing absorbance, producing phase contrast, producing... No, in the fluorescent microscopy, is your sample is the source of the light. So it's like right now you are seeing through this screen, it's just a reflection of light. If you see the screen of your mobile phone, it's extremely more contrasted than this screen. Why that? Because the screen of your mobile phone is your source of light, while here the source of light is just a reflection. So that's why here you don't get the, such a beautiful high contrast you have on in front of your screen. Speaking about and going back to the main concept to fluorescence, uh, it's good to remember that it's not something extremely, let's say, it's not a brand new uh, discovery. We can go back to 1845 to um, William Herschel that, okay, he didn't use Canada Dry to do his experiment, but was the first to describe and to publish uh, the fact that the quinine so solution, water solution with quinine inside was reacting to particular uh, lights, to particular wavelengths, so to uh, ultraviolet light, producing a, this sort of phenomena. So the production of new light coming out from the sample. Few years later, uh, also uh, Gabriel Stokes came out with the same phenomena. As you see, in that moment, the laboratory were slightly different. The, the legends say that he was uh, looking to the classical a solution of quinine. The solution of quinine, for the one of you that don't know, is was the the only let's say treatment for malaria. Okay, so and uh, it was looking through what's happened to this solution thanks to the light passing through the 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 glasses of a church. The glass of of a church is made of crystal, so was able to be transparent to the UV light. Okay, our general uh, glass is not transparent to UV light. It's opaque to UV light. You don't get uh, sunbathed when you, while you are studying uh, in your laboratory behind the glass. Okay, you need to go to open the window. In that case, this particular glass was uh, almost transparent to the UV light being a crystal based on lead. There was a different type of glass. And this illumination produced uh, this the f fluorescence phenomena that was in fact uh, really visible because uh, Stokes uh, and before him Herschel was looking at them thanks to a glass of wine as I told you the laboratory was slightly different in the 18th century and the glass of wine act as a filter so blocking the all the rest of the light all the sunlight uh, was a white wine so was a, so this filter was blocking the yellow component of the light just leaving the blue component of the fluorescence coming out we will go to this concept in few slides but that's just to show you how it was for the first time described and this we are still in the 18th century from stokes so what is phenomenon what's happened in uh, the molecule uh, in the in the solution in that case fluorescence is happen when you have 
the ability of certain molecules, theoretically speaking, all molecules can be fluorescent. In reality, 99.9% .9 of molecules abroad that simply made, have this phenomenon with such a low efficiency that we don't see, we will never see it. But generally, molecule rich of aromatic rings uh, with particular chemical structure are able to, uh, to receive photons, to receive a photon, and uh, some of their electrons are, once they receive photons, in that case we are mentioning UV absorption, but it can be also a regular light, a regular visible light, this photon hitting the external electron of the molecule, or in that case of the atom, makes this electron jump on a higher uh, energy state. So the electron is moved on a, on a different energetic state, and when is naturally decaying to the, uh, to the regular uh, to the regular st steady state is releasing again a new photon of light. Clearly, this cannot be a, a phenomena with uh, um, with gaining of energy. You are using a certain amount of energy to, or the energy of the photon that hitting your electron will be higher than the energy of the photon release because a part of the energy will be lost in this uh, decaying stage. This. The phenomenon was described, in fact, uh, mathematically for the first time by Yablowski, Professor Yablowski, that uh, produced this uh, version or this uh, simplified, you will see something more complicated in a few minutes, but this simplified version of the diagram, which here we have the ground state of the, of the external electron of the molecules. When we provide the energy, the sufficient energy, we have a phenomenon called excitation. The, the fact that it's called excitation is like a landmark because you will see in the microscope, you will see excitation path and emission path or excitation filter, emission filter. So these names are not by chances. So you have the excitation of the electron, then you have a vibrational state. The electron from the first excited states go down to a secondary excited state that is the one able to release the photon. So falling down back to the ground state, you have the release of a photon. Okay, this is the fluorescence phenomenon. It's uh, extremely inefficient. You need to stimulate several times or several molecules to have this effect. It's not something you have one fluorescent molecule, you hit them and you get every time fluorescence. In any case, this is more than sufficient to have right now great uh, microscopy uh, visualization, great microscopy experiments. Speaking about fluorescence, I told you about molecules uh, with aromatic ring. It's easy to think about some chemically produ produced uh, uh, in, uh, in laboratory stuff. Uh, nothing now is true for particular molecules, but we need to remind that the nature is plenty of fluorescent molecules. We generally don't walk around with uh, mono, with lamp, with just one wavelength and with a filter just to visualize, but especially in the in the in the botanic uh, in the bo both in I would say both in uh, uh, both in the animal kingdom and in the uh, vegetal kingdom we have plenty of fluorescent phenomena and also in the mineral clearly we have this so we are uh, a lot a lot of uh, um, example of natural occurring fluorescence here I cite I just add to this image taken from uh, uh, from Zeiss also the the Aquiora Victoria that was the jellyfish that in the end of the 60s, 1960, so you see one century, you need to, was the one that was first uh, uh, discovered to carrying a protein, not single molecule, not small molecule, but a protein producing fluorescence, the green fluorescent protein. Other example of uh, regular, of natural fluorescence are, you know, um, flowers, uh, animals, uh, different with, heated with different wavelengths, produce different fluorescence. And this often is, uh, is a characteristic in the animal kingdom due to the different ability of the animals to see better particular wavelength comparing to others. Not uh, every single species has a different composition in the eyes of, uh, uh, of the um, photo, uh, photon receptors, so cones and so on. As I mentioned you, the, uh, the jellyfish uh, with the GFP, this uh, discovery brought in 2008 to the Nobel Prize for the uh, Shimura, Kofi, and 
the most known, I would say, is uh, Cien, which was the one that really um, created the fact that GFP is right now so, so commonly used in microscopy, in uh, not only microscopy, but especially microscopy, as a tag, as a, f a fusion protein. And they work, uh, especially in the Cien laboratory, they work modifying this uh, fluorescent protein to create, uh, I would say, a plethora of different possible fluorescent protein with different light, different, different um, optical properties in terms of the color they would produce. So they developed several different mutants for, uh, uh, for this um, original protein. Now, again, why having so many different fluorescent protein, for example? Simply because we never get satisfied. So it's great to have a fluorescent uh, to see our sample with uh, one fluorescent, but I bet that any one of you would be really satisfied by just a picture with one color. We are not used to seeing one color. We like to see contrast also in terms of different color present and different, uh, um, and different elements, especially because in biology we want to study maybe interaction of two proteins, we need to see both of them. Both of them needs to be fluorescent, but we need to be able to distinguish them. So we cannot use two green or two red or so on. We need to be able to use, in that case here is just an example of the protein, fluorescent protein, but we will mention later on also different dyes, different, and also uh, Michaela later on will mention different probes that allow us to color each different elements with a different, um, uh, with a different wavelength. Uh, clearly, every fluorophore Every molecule able to produce a fluorescence is called a fluorophore, and every fluorophore has a particular design or particular spectra. Later on, we will go on this, but just on, I will just uh, start just uh, one. The two lines that you see here is they represent the let's say the ability. I would say this is the excitation spectra and the emission spectra for each of these molecules. So that means that, and here on the bottom you see the wavelength. And here is just, a, let's say, the intensity of the fluorescence that is produced. But I mean that you can excite or radiate 400 nanometer, 450, 500 nanometer, which is a blue light or blue-greenish light. And then here you see the, the fluorescence that is emitted. Later on, we will go on this because it's essential to, to understand this kind of graph to know what are you doing with your microscope or simply to understand if your microscope is OK for what you want to do. So. Again, we mentioned before, fluorescence is the ability to absorb energy as a form of light, or absorb light, absorb photon as a, in energy. And this happens with a particular absorption profile. So in that case, this is uh, one of the dye I just mentioned you before. It's called Alexa Fluor. We don't care. It's just a commercial red fluorescent dye. This red fluorescent dye has this yellow line uh, showing us that it is able to be excited already at the level of, uh, let's say, 50% with a wavelength of about uh, 525. So with a green light, we are already exciting about 50% of the molecules that are generally excited. We can reach the 100% with the 550, or better, 555. That's what the name came from. And once it's excited, you have the, you have the, let's say, the vibrational state of this electron producing, uh, jumping to, jumping, falling down to the steady state, releasing a photon. This photon will be clearly less energetic. So please remind, low, small wavelength, high energy. Long wavelength, low energy. So going to longer wavelength, changing the color of the light that you use, that, that is uh, produced, and releasing with a less energetic amount of, uh, of energy. So here you see what is so-called the emission profile spectrum. Now, one thing and one of the key concepts that I want to make to you extremely clear, uh, people tend to think, oh, if I excite my molecule, because you see this kind of is called a mirror. This is as often called as a mirror effect of the emission and excitation profile. Uh, is simply a thermodynamic effect, but please do not think that if I stimuli my red fluorescent here, I will get this 
I will get this fluorescence. These are two separated, I would say, phenomena. This is just the probability to excite the molecule. So once you are at about 525, as I told you, you have 50% probability. Once you are 555, you have 90% probability to excite the molecule. The red line is the probability to produce a light, but it's not dependent on which energy was used to stimulate. So once it's stimulated, you have about 90% of probability to have or 90% of uh, intensity of light is coming in that area, but you can also have light coming here. You will over uh, every time have about 10% of light that is red and so on. Okay, so this is just to remind you that when we speak about a fluorescent molecule and we consider them as a single color, they are not. So the green fluorescent protein is not green. Is green, orange, slightly red, uh, slightly, uh, slightly, slightly far red, and so on. Why we see it green? We will check in a few minutes. Thanks to filters and thanks to the ability to just select this area of the spectra that is uh, produced. But uh, clearly, remind that you produce every time you can stimulate with a, quite a large part of the spectra, and you can uh, you produce emission in a quite large part of the spectra in any case. The distance between the absorption and the emission spectra is called by the name of the, you know, the guy that was playing in the church with the wine and the kinin, Stoke, is, is called by him because was the one that firstly discovered that there is a, a variable distance between the maximum uh, profile of the absorption and the maximum profile of the emission. Their distance is, I would say, is the amount of energy that is lost in vibrational state, that is lost not producing light. Clearly, if the molecule is extremely efficient and is not uh, losing light, losing energy in vibrating, it will get the emission wavelength that is much nearer to the absorption or the excitation wavelength, because immediately get excited and released in really in the similar energy. So that means that the vibrational status is minimal. So this is what we want to achieve right now with uh, chemically produced dye, while generally the natural fluorescence uh, molecule are generally more uh, prone to have quite a large stoke shift. So they, have, they are generally are quite more, uh, they have a high distance. I have to admit that sometimes a high stoke shift, so a quite a large distance makes uh, makes life for uh, microscopists easier because we'll get easier to have the right microscope able to illuminate using that part and and uh, acquiring using that part of the spectra because I mean you can have a you can have a separation that is placed here but also here but also here whilst when they are really near you really need to have a specific and highly specific filters and highly specific setup to work with them but in any case this is what is called the stock shift and it's something that when you will work with your fluorophore it's good that you have a look at them so once you will start making your experiment in fluorescence please have a look to the fluorophore you're using not only to understand the compatibility with your system so with the different filter cubes and so on we will see but also to understand their, pro their properties so how much energy they waste in vibrational status that because this vibrational status, for, for instance, is heat. So heat is something that will disturb your sample. And as you will see with uh, Michaela later on, will create troubles in your, in your experiment. As uh, again here, as I mentioned before, please remind that these spectra or extinction coefficients or fluorescence intensity, in fact, are uh, measurements of probability and efficiency. Uh, one important, uh, I think, really important, I think, take home message is that the fluorescence you produce is not higher, higher the light you are using. So your fluorophore get either excited, your single fluorophore, let's say, let's go back to the single fluorophore you have, GFP molecule, Alexa fluor, and so on. Either is excited in that moment, so it's producing the photon. Either is not excited, so it's not producing photon. 
so it's not that if you increase the light, I'm not speaking about the wavelength, eh? I'm speaking about the intensity of the lamp you're going to be using or the laser or whatever, you will uh, increase the light produced by that single molecule. That single molecule, it will be either on or off. It's, a, it's, an, it's an all or nothing phenomenon for each single fluorophore. What's happened when you increase your light, when you increase the amount of light, is that you increase the probability to excite more fluorophore. But please consider this is really important because when you get uh, uh, extremely high with the illumination path, you generally increase noise, uh, you increase uh, all the possible other problems that you get. So you have really to figure out that you're not, oh, I don't see well enough, uh, probably uh, I need to increase the, my, my power uh, source or my light. Generally, if you don't see well enough, probably your experiments needs to be redone. It's not, maybe you need another fluorophore, you need a batch new of the antibody or a new dye or a different dye, but maybe it's not the, the lamp, it's not the microscope. Okay, so as we just before, and just as a reminder, the different electrons from the steady states can jump on top with different wavelength. So some wavelength is simply not sufficient to make the electron reach the excited state. Other wavelength are enough, and then you get the vibration, you get the heat production, and then you have the release with the emission, with the molecules returning to the lowest vibrational state. And with the light emitted, you get the back to the ground state. This phenomena is extremely fast and can happen hundreds, thousands, uh, millions of times in the few seconds you're looking at. The fluorescent phenomena is in the time scale of femto to nanosecond. So once you are looking to your sample for one second, you can just uh, you are just stimulating about one million times your single fluorophore. You can bet uh, this single fluorophore sometimes is not so happy to be heated one million times by photon in the head, uh, making the electron jumping on top and going down. So that's why you need to take care of your setup because the easiest things to do is producing photobleaching, destroying your sample, destroying the fluorescence of your sample because you are uh, using too much light to illuminate them. Because the phenomena is extremely, extremely fast, much faster than our ability to, to appreciate uh, if, the if the slide we are seeing, if the cells we are looking at are uh, beautiful or not. So. Now that we, I hopefully convinced you that we like uh, fluorescence because it's giving us high contrast and high specificity and it's extremely bright. Uh, how is made a fluorescent microscope the comparing to a, diff to a regular microscope? Okay, here, well, in these days you will probably see much, much more often uh, inverted microscope. Here I present you in a classical upright, but just as I mentioned you, here in the classical world of transmitted light, the bright field illumination, if you want, you get the classical white light passing through your sample. And then your samples will modify this light, absorption, phase contrast, uh, in, in DIC, uh, polarization, whatever you can get. And then you can collect the light from with the lens and reaching your eyes, reaching the camera. In the field of fluorescence, as I told you uh, right at the beginning, is your sample producing the light. So how this happened? You have a particular lamp that we will see in uh, a couple of slides that goes illuminating the samples thanks to the objective. This is true for 99% of the fluorescent microscopy. There are some types of microscopy with the illumination coming from the side, but generally speaking, you generally use the same objective you are using to collect the image is the one you are using to illuminate your sample. So it acts as a condenser. So the light from a particular lamp is projected to the sample. The sample will produce fluorescence, will produce light, and that light will be collected back by the objective and going to your eyes or to a beautiful camera. As you see, there is one particular element here in the middle that change the behavior of a microscope from a regular 
white bright field microscope for you know, classical histology, for hematoxylineosine or whatever, to a fluorescent microscope. So for, the, for that reason, uh, fluorescence is an additive phenomenon because you keep collecting photons from your, from your samples. And you can collect photons from different wavelengths, from different light, and you can produce uh, the different uh, multicolor image like this. So the typical component of the scheme that I show you before of a um, epifluorescence microscope are a particular light source and the excitation filter, dichroic mirror and emission filter that, just to point out, is this particular part present here. So let's start with the light source, just a couple of slides about this. As I told you before, the uh, fluorescence phenomena is pretty inefficient. So you cannot illuminate your sample with the regular, with a regular lamp that you're generally using, you know, the general LED or halogen lamp that you use on the bottom here. You cannot place that lamp here and hopefully uh, produce uh, a reasonable fluorescence. You need uh, particular lamps that are able to produce, to be extremely, extremely bright, extremely high in the intensity of the light, to produce enough photon and with enough energy to stimulate your sample. For that reason, generally, there are several, right now on the, on the market, there are several types of lamps because, well, the tungsten, tungsten are probably the less common, but mercury lamp, xenon lamp, or right now the most used are metal light lamp. These lamps are, have the characteristic to produce particular spectral profile of uh, light they produce. You would see them, in any case, white looking at them. Please don't look at them, because they produce a lot of UV light. So that part of the microscope needs to stay closed in the microscope. When you switch on the fluorescence lamp, you will just see in the back is a, a brightness coming out from the back of the microscope, but don't look to a fluorescence lamp with your open eyes, without any screen, without any protection, because this will burn your eyes and your career as microscopist will be extremely short. Okay? <laughs> so, because they produce a lot of UV, UV components. So the glass of this lamp is transparent to UV, another difference from the classical uh, halogen lamp. The halogen lamp don't, do not produce UV light, or at, at least the UV component of the light is completely shielded by the glass. These glass are particular because they're transparent to the UV component. This lamp to produce light, they need also a particular, I would say, power supply increasing the, uh, the amount of energy provided. You have to imagine that the classical lamp, uh, we have around the classical 220 volt. Generally, this kind of lamp, they need a condenser nearby providing 2000 volts to work. Even if it's just small, but please consider this lamp are really uh, hungry in power and really, uh, they really need a short uh, and high tension to work on. They can produce different peak in lights, and they can be more linear or different peak. Now we also have, in the, the most recent version of this, of this light is provided by LED. So we also have now single LED producing single point of light. These are extremely useful, are extremely clean. What makes this lamp really useful, I think, is the fact that this lamp you can switch it on and off pretty fast, while this kind of lamp, by their own nature, I will not go into this detail here, but by their own nature, they need to cool down before switching on. So if you're using the microscope before with this kind of lamp, you generally ask to your colleague if they need it immediately after you, because you don't switch it off and then on. You need to wait half an hour every time or one hour to make everything cooling down. If not, this lamp has a really short lifespan. While LED are extremely fast, are stable. They are uh, the problem. I would say with LED that till the last presentation we had in 2018, the last course, they were not. I would say they were not really powerful enough like the other lamp. So the other lamps were two to five times brighter than the LED. Now in the last three four years, I have to admit that uh, there are on the market also great LED for the illumination. Another source of light clearly can be laser. Lasers that makes them not only single wavelength, but also collimated light, are essentials for a 
for a plethora of particular microscopy techniques uh, of, I would say, advanced fluorescent microscopy, like you will see in a few minutes, thanks to Alessandro uh, Cometa, so confocal microscopy, all the super resolution microscopy require a source that is laser source, because not only for the wavelength, but also for the, uh, for the ability to be collimated. Again, here, just for your knowledge, you find the different peak of the different lamp that you get here. You can ask to the, uh, to the different uh, people, to Andrea or to the other, uh, to the Andrea, the live imager, or to Luca, to the high throughput, to the system, which kind of source this machine has to illuminate the cell. Then the second real elements that makes the microscope and without which a microscope is not a fluorescent microscope, the so-called filter cube. Uh, as you can imagine, cube by the shape, filter by the presence of three specific elements. As I told you, the light source we just mentioned have the ability to produce a lot of different uh, wavelength. In fact, you see them and you see mainly a white light produced by them. But generally, when you want to uh, stimulate one fluorophore, you want to be pretty specific. You don't want to illuminate with lights that is not efficient in producing the excitation status. So in the case of GFP, you generally use a blue light, 488 nanometer is the classical wavelength of the blue light, and to achieve the maximal, the maximal efficiency in stimulating the fluorophore. To do this, after the, so the light source that is here, and producing, I would say, the white light with all the single wavelength component, you get what is called excitation filter. Remember the, the graph I show you with excitation and emission line? Excitation filter is the one providing you the light hitting the, a window of light just for the excitation part of the spectrum. So you will use just, I would say in that case, blue light. Then you have one element, 45 degrees generally, placed here, that is called Sono già in ritardo? Sorry, I'm already late. No, sorry. Uh, for, this is called dichroic mirror. Okay, uh, this is uh, just mentioning you. Uh, it's often called dichroic, it's a mistake. Uh, they should be called dichromatic. Dichromatic because stands for the fact that it has two behavior with two different wavelengths. So dichroma, two chromes, two colors, two different behavior. So for the blue light, this particular glass is a uh, is, a, is a mirror. So the light hit the mirror and is projected down. Go into the objective and the objective bring the light to the specimen. Your specimen produce the fluorescence and the light produced by the fluorescence come back. Once it coming back, this light is able to bypass this filter. So is the filter, is a mirror for the blue light, is an open window for the for your specific fluorescence. In the case that would say, let's say this is a red FP, red fluorescent, uh, red fluorescent produce, illuminated with the blue or with the green, and then the red light is able to bypass the decoric mirror. And then you have another filter, just emission filter, just selecting the light, the highest efficiency part of the spectra where our fluorophore is expressing, and then we have our ocular, our cameras, our detector. Again here, this is the classical illumination path for the classical GFP. You select the blue light from the light source. The blue light is mirrored down from, thanks to the dichromatic mirror, to the, thanks to the objective to the sample. The sample became green because you were really good in producing green fluorescent protein. And this green light can go back and bypass this filter and go to the ocular. These filter cubes are generally presented, if you want to know in your microscope, if, is, if, sorry, if the filter cube you are using is fine for your fluorophore, you can go to the, uh, to the producer of the, of the filter cube and you will find this stuff. Okay, don't get scared. It's simpler than it looks. This, the different line, just represent the different ability, the properties of the three elements of the filter cube. So let's start with excitation. The red line is the one, this is, oh, sorry. 
wavelength, again, light, okay, the different color of the light, transmission, so the ability to be transparent. So mainly a glass is 100% transparent, never true, but almost 100% transparent. So excitation filter. We have, you see, white light here, yellow light, if you want. We want to select just this part of the light, just the green. So this wavelength is that part. So this first filter is transparent, at least to the 80%, to this part of the light. So the light coming with this blue color is able to pass here. Then we have the dichromatic mirror. So forget about this part. It's just, oh, we don't use that. We, we don't need about this. But you see the dichromatic mirror is, let's say, completely blocking the light that correspond to excited light. You see, no transparency, no transmission. So it's completely blocking the light. So that means that this wavelength, this light can go here, but here is reflected, is a mirror, because it's completely blocked. Then go down, production of the fluorescence, production of the light. The light come back, has a higher wavelength. And in that case, this dichromatic mirror, you see, became completely transparent or almost completely transparent over this uh, particular wavelength, 400 and 500 probably here, so became transparent. So the light is able to go through. Then we know that our fluorophore here is around that color, this green, GFP. So the emission filter that is here is the one just collecting this part of the light. And that's why, thanks to this emission filter, that's why we see GFP green. And we don't see GFP green, yellow, and red. The, the, excitation, the emission spectra of the GFP is coming here as a peak here, and then keep on producing photons also in the red. But we don't want to see red. We want to see just the part with the maximum, with the maximum uh, level of excitation. That just to let you know, clearly, every fluorophore you get, you need a filter cube. So in uh, regular microscope are generally with this kind of shape, either in barrel or in, uh, um, or in slider. These are getting more, more and more uh, rare. Different company, suddenly, that's my question to become why you do every time different filter cube. I would like to change between the different microscopes. So every company has their own filter cubes. So it's not so easy to move from a Zeiss microscope. You cannot move a filter from an icon to a Zeiss or to a Leica. So just remind, okay, I will use that microscope. I have that filters. Now there are also uh, brand now in the last uh, few uh, years, uh, they came out really good multi-band filters called that create several different window of excitation and emission, excitation and emission that have to admit makes life, let's say, easier if you want to see everything all together, less uh, scientifically significant from the point of view of what you get because you have a lot of uh, uh, cross-talk, cross of signal. You will never know if your signal came from a fluorophore or from another one. So if you can, my suggestion is stay with single filter cube because it's uh, much more precise you get one color every time it's slower because to take good fluorescent image with different elements you will need to take one for the green one for the red one for the blue one for the far red and so on and then you either the software or you you will have to uh, superimpose the image but the image you will collect it will be much cleaner and much uh, uh, more precise also i think uh, cometa with the uh, confocal will speak probably also about the fact that you need to work with uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, differential scanning, so scanning before with a laser and then with another. So, again, just uh, summarizing some concept. Why fluorescent microscopy? Because generally, when you look at the classical cell or tissue, uh, you are transparent. Uh, over, uh, out of your uh, uh, red blood cells. If I slice you thin enough, I will not do it, but if I slice you thin enough, you are transparent. So either I color you with hematocidine or zine or whatever, I cannot see anything. I see just some, uh, just some absorbance, but really no real information. While fluorescent microscopy allow me to detect and to go on single cell constituent to detect single element of the cells to increase my specificity of what we are looking at. 
For that reason, now we have really an incredible number of fluorescent dyes and keep on growing, both for their um, fluorescent characteristics, so their ability to be photostable, their ability to be extremely short in stock shift or large in stock shift, depends on what you want to achieve, or with an extremely long lifespan or limited half-life of the fluorescence. But in any case, you have also a lot of new uh, dye and fluorophore connected to the element you want to see. So nuclei, DNA, RNA, uh, proteins, and, and so on. Just for remind you, this is just a small list that I took from a, from a paper. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to add the citation here from the paper. But right now we have classical fluorescence for protein analog to measure into or phospholipid analog. So you can see a cytoskeletal element, you can see membrane elements, you can see the DNA or the RNA. Uh, you also have a great fluorescent indicator of uh, a pH, of uh, calcium uh, level, magnesium level into the cells. So they really became an incredible tools uh, also to see in live what's going on into the cells. Uh, you get uh, particular techniques uh, based on proximity indicator allowing you, thanks to the creation of a fluorescence, this is called FRET technique, but it's simply the ability, it's not simple, it's the ability to see uh, two molecules, two proteins generally interacting because they are so near, they, they recreate a the fluorescence. There are a plethora of new biosensors based on enzymatic activity. We keep on using a lot um, molecular based labeling or recombinant uh, protein, fluorescent protein, to make fusion protein with GFP, red FP, and so on, to see our own protein of interest in fusion with something fluorescent going around the cells or seeing where it's accumulating and what's going on. And again, other biosensor of the, of the, the classical calcium, but now there are also from other ions. Some basic features that I want you to remind about fluorescence is that the excitation occurs generally in these time scales, which I don't even know, Fento is 12, I think, so I don't know, Pico. Is the picosecond is the time scale, the real time scale of the fluorescence. So it's the amount of time that takes the photon to excite the electron. The emission occurs in nano, uh, sorry, in uh, uh, fento to nano, 10 to 9, or dozens of nanoseconds. You generally have quite a broad excitation spectrum and excitation uh, emission peak. And the stock shift uh, separation of excitation and emission peaks is pretty important once you want to work with multiple fluorophore because uh, you need to use your visible spectra in a way that you get the blue color, the green color, the red color, the red fluorescence, the green fluorescence, the blue fluorescence, or the far red fluorescence separated as much as possible. Uh, I have to admit, fortunately now we take a lot of advantage of the fact that uh, cameras are uh, uh, are not better than our highs in, uh, in absolute, but they are generally more sensitive out of the visible spectra. So we generally see from 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer in our, if we are lucky enough not to be daltonic. Uh, so we see our light, the visible light is considered from 400 to 700. In the microscope you are using, you will probably use a light from about 350 up to 800, 850 nanometer because the sensor you are using, the cameras, the photomultiplier and so on, are even able to see a light that our eyes is not able to see any longer as a, as a visible light. So the near infrared is visible to the camera. Some things that I think you should evaluate in terms of, uh, of, the, uh, of the samples you get, of the fluorophore you, you have, is, the, is this kind of elements that probably also uh, Michaela later on will cite. So the, it's important, I think, for you to know a little bit about what is the quantum efficiency of your fluorophore or their photostability. These two elements, uh, well, just to, just to make it extremely short, the highest, higher they are, better for you, generally speaking. You want fluorophore with a good or with a high quantum efficiency and with a good photostability. That means that while you are looking your sample under a microscope, they will not fade away in a few seconds. And the quantum efficiency, their ability to produce fluorescence is, uh, is higher as at the maximum. 
uh, why I cite you this? Because often you will find yourself in the middle of a situation where you need to decide how to proceed with an experiment. You want to buy a secondary antibody with a fluorophore attached on the back, and you don't know which fluorophore attached uh, on the back you would like to. So often you say, often, you would, in that case, you would go to the microscope and check the filter cube. That's why I stress you about the filter cube and say, okay, I have this kind of filter cube. But then you also need to go and see which is the best fluorophore in the range of the filter cube that you can use. I mention you this because often it's happened that people say, oh, I have a filter cube that is extremely specific or extreme, is perfect for uh, the Alexa 555 that I show you at the beginning. Alexa 555 is an horrible fluorophore. has a quantum efficiency that is horrible. So don't use it. But uh, uh, often the filter cube are filtered for this kind of fluorescence. So people keep uh, think, okay, I will take this uh, uh, secondary antibody with this fluorophore because it will be perfect. Often, or if not ever, it's better to take the Alexa 460 for 467 uh, or other fluorophore, slightly uh, decentered, but with uh, probably, I think, eight to 10 times higher quantum efficiency. So you have a little bit to balance what you get in terms of microscope and what you get in terms of fluorophore. That's why I cite you these two elements. I do not expect, I'm not an expert in physics, uh, so I'm not an expert in the, in the, uh, um, in the physical law behind the quantum efficiency of the different molecules, but it's important, I think, for us to know that uh, we need to take in consideration these elements. Now, as I mentioned you at the beginning, clearly we would all like to do multiple color imaging with fluorescence. So this can happen thanks to uh, probe that are directly labeling elements of the cells like you know, phalloidin or other elements for the cytoskeletal or antibody, fluorescent dyes, fluorescent fusion protein or fluorescent antibody. These are the classical uh, probes that you can use to produce the different color. Then something that happens often for people starting at the beginning with fluorescent microscopy and looking to the camera, generally what you get are these two pictures. Generally, the cameras of a fluorescent microscope are monochromatic. They just take the photon coming out. It's then the software, it's then you heading the color of what you get. Because the important information is the amount of photon you get. Then the color is just, let's say, it's just the one provided by the filter cube or whatever, but you, this is what you get from the, from the camera. With your eyes, you would see just one of the two colors with the different filter cube, and to get this image, you will go on the screen. This is just to mention you what you can get, and this is just the tools that I invite you to use for your uh, microscope. This, I think, came from Thermo, but you will find it on Zeiss website, Olympus website, Nikon. Uh, it's called Spectra Viewer. These are on the online. I will show you later on in the break. You can select the fluorophore you're going to use. You can select the filter cube you get. And you have the drawing of the excitation and the emission spectra for all the molecules. Please consider these are just all top to 100. That does not mean that your fluorescence will be equal for all of them. It's just their way to normalize. But in this way, you can see that, for instance, this is how I would have designed an experiment with these four fluorophore, a nuclear staining, UXT, an Alexa or a GFP, green, a 555, that was generally considered a red fluorescent, but you see is an orange, is a yellow orange, and then Alexa Fluor 647, or this is a far red, so this is not visible with your eyes. So if you illuminate with red light and you try to look at them through the eyepieces, you will not see anything. Or if you see something, please let us know because you would become a great caria, uh, or you would, or maybe or a superhero. That depends. But let, let us know if you see in the far red because that would be really interesting. So with this kind of four fluorophores selected, I know that I can have filters that allow me to, to excite here and collect this light, to excite here and collect this light. Excite right here and collect this orange. Excite here and collect this. 
So with four different filter cubes, I would be able to collect the four colors and having and have uh, four uh, coloration. Now, there are microscope system based on white laser and so on, able to provide you up to six, seven, eight colors. I do not think it's, it's really so worthy in several cases because at the end you need to work with so small window of acquisition that you lose a lot of ability to collect your photons. So it's better, I think, to remain to four up to maximum five different floors. This, just to mention you, blue color, green color, red color. In that case, also a bright field image. As you see in this bright field image, when I mentioned you about the, okay, 10, 20, about the specificity, you see your cells. Okay, now probably because you are not uh, uh, like my son, three years old, you know that this probably is a nuclei, but nobody tells you, okay? Or we probably know that here there are DNA, but probably no one, there is no a flag, there is nothing. Uh, that probably there are some vesicles around. Here there are definitely there is cytoskeletal, we don't see it. So fluorescent allow us to see single filament of the cytoskeletal, this is actin uh, phalloidin, so uh, a, a dye able to connect to the, to the actin filaments. Then we have an antibody against uh, this uh, pathogen that is uh, uh, paras uh, parasite, this pathogen of these cells, and then we have the DAPI, like the host, is staining not only the nuclei, but also the DNA of these parasitic cells. That's why you see all this blue stuff. But all of this from here would not be visible. That's why we need fluorescence, because we have specific elements visible. And then you can have, you, and then you produce your, or you, or the software produce your superimposed image with the different Parasite, the red are your, your culture cells, the DNA of your cells. These cells is poorly infected by several, you see, DNA of, the, of these different bacteria. You can have uh, staining for Golgi apparatus, uh, cytoskeletal. The color is just your choice, okay? Right now, I have to admit the color is just your choice. Uh, just, uh, just a suggestion. The blue for the nuclei is for two reasons. Simply because for the nuclei, for the DNA, uh, nuclei is in that case, but for the DNA, uh, because generally the fluorescence in blue is even less efficient than the other fluorescence. And the DNA is, is a lot, it's massive. So it's easier to get an incredibly bright signal with the blue. Often all fluorescent microscopy tests at least once in a lifetime, uh, beautiful or theoretically beautiful, uh, dyes in the blue for secondary antibody in the blue and so on, they generally are quite uh, uh, weak, are pretty weak. So unless you really need to, I would avoid to use the blue to produce a specific staining for other stuff. I would stay with the blue light or the UV light producing blue fluorescence for the DNA. But that depends clearly on the, on the requirements of the experiment. These again, some other experiments uh, showing you the possibility to have up to four color and with their uh, superimposition. And again, as I told you, the color here, for instance, what you see here, uh, violet was a far red staining. Far red, you need to provide a color to see them because far red is a, is a sort of brown, so dark brown that you don't see them. And so you, you simply provide the color to to make it visible. Again, if you work with GFP, make it green, okay? Because sometimes I, I see in some papers uh, or some thesis, people say, oh, would a result better having as red? It's true that your camera will collect as uh, black and white uh, often uh, the GFP, but please later on color them as a green and don't color them as a red or orange because generally that makes a, a, a mess when you, have to, when you have to look at the paper or the thesis. Uh, just uh, two minutes before uh, letting all of us uh, uh, go to, um, to a coffee break. Uh, fluorescent microscopy, over then the specificity and the contrast, allow us to, was at least now, was developed to achieve incredibly high resolution, even super resolution, that means over the optical limit of uh, the Abbe's law. And also, the ability provided us the, the fact that we are illuminating with single wavelengths, 
with specific wavelengths allow us to move from the classical wide field to optical sectioning provided by confocal microscopy or to super resolution microscopy, which are generally a sort of evolution of the confocal microscopy in at least in two cases or over three. Just because in the classical epifluorescence, you get a column of light hitting your sample. When you go with confocal, you will be able to illuminate, thanks to the fact that you will use a laser, so another particular laser so, uh, light source, you will be able to illuminate uh, efficiently just one part of the, of the sample, of the cells, and that's why you get this incredibly uh, sharp image, simply because you don't get all the disturbance from the top and from the bottom. This I will let you for the next lecture, so you already know that fluorescence is evolved in fluorescent in confocal microscopy. And I just want to show you and mention you for the last two minutes the full version of the Jablowski diagram. As I told you, this is much more scary. scary. <laughs> Simply because one of the evolution of the uh, fluorescent microscopy, especially in terms of super resolution microscopy, uh, take uh, advantage of particular characteristic, physical characteristic of the electrons and of the uh, excited state of the molecule. In particular, the fact that you can, you see, well, on the left side, you see the classical fluorescence. Excitation, relaxation or vibrational status, emission with fluorescence. So the red light is the classical fluorescence. In fact, there are the possibility to go also to so-called delayed fluorescence or, uh, or non-radiative relaxation, so the ability of the molecule to release the, the, the photon without producing fluorescence. And these internal elements, internal conversion and vibrational relaxation and so on, these are all elements that are uh, developed, that are used by the the super resolution microscopy based on the, the storm or stochastic reconstruction or single uh, illumination or by stead where you get the excitation and then the depletion the ability to eliminate a part of the fluorescence this i will not mention but we will discuss probably in the next few days because you will have also a presentation mentioning that part so i will give you the the slide just to have an idea and then I just mention you because on a regular fluorescent microscope, but we will discuss also in present on the, the facility, we have also the structure illumination. These are all evolution of the microscopy that are uh, possible simply because you are, you are working with fluorescence, because we are working with the fact that your sample are the source of the light. So please, before complaining with the instruments, complaining with your samples, because generally are your samples that are not producing the light, okay? And with this, or not enough light. With this, I will let you just a couple of slides for your knowledge, because I think it's important for everyone to understand that there is no the perfect machine for everything. That's why you will work on the confocal, on a, on a high throughput, uh, on a, a live imager, there is not a machine working for everything. There is no uh, fast SUV, four-wheel drive, uh, jumping on a hill and making a good uh, uh, lap on the track. Either you need a, a fast machine, either you need a four-wheel drive on your sample, fixed sample, slim sample. So several different techniques, several different samples, several different requirements, okay? And here, I will not get through. If not, they will kill me because uh, you will not get the time for the coffee break. But uh, here you will find just a small summary of what we just told. Please remind about the elements of the parameter. Don't get too lost about extinction coefficient, but thinking about quantum yield or the ability of your floor for to work as expected. Remind about the stoke shift and so the ability to use more floor for than once in than one in your sample because that's allow you to make multiple color in a clean way and remember this is i think my most important take on message even though it's uh it's uh, it seems a little bit cryptic remember that the intensity of the fluorescence you get is a matter of the probability of switching on the floor okay as I mentioned right at the beginning, 
do not increase the light to increase the intensity of that single fluorophore. That single fluorophore is on or off. When you increase the light, you increase up to a certain level the ability to have more fluorophore on at the same time, in the same nanosecond time scale. And also remember that the wavelengths represent the energy that you are using. So shorter the wavelength, highest is the energy you're using. Longer the wavelength is lower the energy you're using. And with this, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to, uh, to speak with all of you also because it's really great to be back after this time. Uh, for, also for the future, if you need to uh, contact uh, me for you know, any doubts about what we just discussed, you will find the email in the, uh, in the, in the presentation. And here's just some text that I found really useful in terms of what you, uh, what you can uh, uh, learn about fluorescent microscopy about this. And thank you for all. Bye.